around in the neighborhood of God, the mile is not going to help you. The yardstick, the ruler, the tape measure, these things are of no value in the universe that God has made. We're using the greatness of the universe. Anybody make it out to the indescribable tour, by the way, if you guys were there? The story of it in a nutshell was that the heavens are telling the glory of God. Their expanse declares the work of his hands. In other words, all you have to do is look up and you see the size of the God that we're worshiping tonight. We ended that. Just a little review with this galaxy right here, the Whirlpool Galaxy. You're like, man, alive. We're talking about astronomy at a Christian worship service. Why not? The God that we're worshiping tonight is the one who created that right there. It's called the darling of astronomy. The reason why is it's sitting completely perpendicular to us on Earth. And when we look up at it, we get this beautiful view. But check this out. The Whirlpool Galaxy is 31 million light years away from where you're sitting right now. Okay, they got nothing in here tonight. 31 million light years away. That's just the first little thing we got to catch up with tonight. By the way, the story opens like this. In case you forgot, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, let there be light, and there was light. And that was a phenomenal moment when that happened because light came out of the mouth of God traveling 186,000 miles a second. That's how fast light is traveling through the universe. And so a light year, therefore, is how far light travels in one year. And I'll do the math for you. It's 5.88 trillion miles is a light year. So as we talked about before, when you start to get around in the neighborhood of God, the mile is not gonna help you. The yardstick, the ruler, the tape measure, these things are of no value in the universe that God has made. We're using a ruler called a light year that's 5.88 trillion miles long. And if you'd like to go to the Whirlpool Galaxy, be my guest, all you have to do is multiply 31 million, that's how many light years it is away, by 5.88 trillion miles, and that's the distance that you've got to cover. A anybody with me so far? I'm, I'm wondering, are there any science lovers here tonight? Because we're going to have a little scientific content tonight, and I need to know if anybody's going to be with me so far. So you do the math, or you could look at it a different way. You just have to travel 186,000 miles a second for 31 million years, and voila, you will arrive at the Whirlpool Galaxy. Second thing that's pretty stunning, given that our God made that, is it contains 300 billion stars in that one galaxy, 300 billion stars. And it is one of hundreds of billions of other galaxies in the known universe that God has made. And it just reminds us all over again tonight, man, this God that we're singing to tonight, he's enormous. He's bigger than anything we've ever dreamed of. He's bigger than our wildest imagination of him. But we ended by looking inside that thing, and this is pretty stunning. Those of you who've seen it remember, but the Hubble Space Telescope is circling the Earth at 360 miles above the Earth, and it takes amazing images of these galaxies and other phenomenon of, of the cosmos, and it looked into that white core of the Whirlpool Galaxy, and lo and behold, there is a black hole in there. And we'd never seen it before until Hubble could take an image of it, and I found this on NASA's site, hubblesite.org. This is what... Hubble sent back to us from 31 million light years away from the black hole core of the Whirlpool Galaxy. They send us back this image right here, and it's just crazy. It's crazy. It's the glory of God, the grandeur of God. It's the grace of God and the mercy of God everywhere we look. It's the imprint of God in all of creation everywhere we turn. And tonight we just want to begin with the bigness of God, the, the grandeur of God all over again. We're going to do it by looking at four stars. Can, can you handle four stars tonight? The first one's easy because there's just one star in our solar system, and that star is called the sun. Thank you very much. Yes, it's our own star. It's, uh, there's an image of it for you, by the way. It's a little more fierce than we often think. It's 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, but what I want you to see about it is how big it is. It's 93 million miles away, so when you're looking up in the sky, it's pretty good pace out there. By the way, light traveling 186,000 miles a second, it's only taken eight minutes to cover that 93 million mile journey to touch your skin here in Atlanta, Georgia. But what I want you to see is the size of it. It's like a million times the size of the earth, and that matters to us tonight when you hear what the psalmist said. Listen to his words. By the word of the Lord, this is Psalm 33, the heavens were made. 
In other words, God didn't lift a finger when he made the universe. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. But he goes on to say, they're starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. So we're looking at something so intense that we don't want to get any closer than 93 million miles away, which is what we are right now. And then we read that God just breathes out stars. It's crazy to think about it. A million times the size of the earth. So here's a little perspective that sort of changed my life. If the earth were the size of a golf ball, okay, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. Okay, that didn't seem to move anybody either, so let me try it a different way. Let me just try it just a different way. I thought I might need this, so I brought a golf ball, okay? So all through the evening, this is going to represent Earth, all right? So this is where we are. I need everybody in the building to look as closely as you can and find yourself, okay? And when you've found yourself, I want you to nod your head so that I know you've located you on the Earth, okay? You're nodding your head? Okay, you found yourself. If the Earth were a golf ball, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. That's not 15 feet in diameter. Can we blow that up just a hair and maybe give them 15 feet in diameter? So here's a little perspective for you, okay? Is this working for anybody? Here we are on the Earth, and that's the sun. It's so big. It's so big, you could put... 960,000 Earths inside the sun. So if the Earth were a golf ball and the, and the sun were 15 feet in diameter, you could put 960,000 golf balls inside that 15-foot diameter sun. That's enough golf balls, by the way, because I know that seems like a big number, to fill a school bus with golf balls could fit inside the 15-foot in diameter sun. It's a massive star, and it's one of hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, our cul-de-sac in the neighborhood called the cosmos that God has made. It's huge, and we're worshiping a star-breathing God tonight. But I want to tell you about the second star, okay? Because the second star absolutely wrecked my life. I heard about it when I was a high school student here in Atlanta. One of our youth leaders did a talk, and he mentioned this star. I didn't know how to talk to God for about two months after I heard about this star. It's called Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. You can pick your pronunciation. I'm obviously going with Betelgeuse, and Betelgeuse is incredible. Here it is in the night sky. I know it doesn't look incredibly ferocious. But it's 427 light years away. So that's 427 times 5.88 trillion miles away from us right now. Draw it in a little closer with the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can start to get a little bit of the feeling of its intensity. But this is the crazy thing about Betelgeuse. Are you ready for this? Betelgeuse is twice the size. Are you ready? You think I'm going to say twice the size of the sun? Oh, no. It's twice the size of the Earth's orbit around the sun, Betelgeuse is. It's crazy. If the earth were a golf ball, <laughs> Betelgeuse would be the height of six Empire State Buildings on top of each other. Now, come on. Have you seen the Empire State Building? <laughs> I mean, maybe what you're going to need to do is gather the family, get a golf ball, get some plane tickets, and fly up to New York. And you're going to go into Midtown. You're going to take your golf ball and put it on the sidewalk outside the Empire State Building. Don't worry about people thinking you're crazy. They're not even going to notice you in New York. You're going to go across the street. You're going to look up at the Empire State Building and imagine five more Empire State Buildings on top of the Empire State Building. That's Beetlejuice, and that's the earth, and somewhere you're on it. You could fit 262 trillion earths inside Beetlejuice. So if the earth were a golf ball, that would be enough golf balls to fill up the Superdome with golf balls 3,000 times. <laughs> when I heard that as a teenager, that stumped me right there. Because most of my praying had been advising God, correcting God, <laughs> suggesting things to God, drawing diagrams for God, reviewing things with God, counseling God. The third star, let's just, can you go a little bit bigger with me? The third star is called Musifi. Here it is in the night sky. It's that gold star to the top left. We, we have the big image of it. It's 3,000 light years away, but I just want you to see it in the, in the span of all these little 
glittering star so that you know that at times when you look up at night, it is not just twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. I'm telling you what you are. What you are is intense and huge and massive and ferocious is what you are. And, and this one used to be called Herschel's Garnet Star. Check it out. If the earth were a golf ball, <laughs> Musifi would be the width of two Golden Gate bridges end to end. Apparently, you're going to need to go from New York to the West Coast. Go to San Francisco with your family and your golf ball. Place your golf ball at the beginning of the Golden Gate Bridge. Go across the bay into Oakland to a high place where you can see the entire Golden Gate Bridge. Another second Golden, break, Go Golden Gate Bridge will be in your imagination. Span all the way back the two Golden Gate Bridges to the very beginning and find your golf ball over there. That's the earth and somewhere you're on it. One of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. It's so big you could fit 2.7 quadrillion earths inside this one star. Thank you so much. Where have you been all night? Now, quadrillion we have not talked about, and I need to explain this just briefly because I don't know about you, but I do not understand the national debt or any numbers bigger than about $875.28. I get that number. Go bigger than that, I don't know. But you need to understand a quadrillion, okay, because this star is crazy big. A quadrillion, uh, let's do it this way. Everybody knows a million, right? How many of you know what a million is? You can kind of get your head around a million. Everybody? All right. You know that a billion is a thousand million and a trillion is a thousand billion and a quadrillion is a thousand trillion, right? Everybody knew that? Here's the perspective. This changed my life, right? A million seconds ago, 12 days ago. Isn't that cool? See, that saves you doing that on your little calculator at home, which I dare you to try to do when you get home tonight. <laughs> but a billion seconds ago? You're thinking, oh my goodness, if it's 12 days ago, I'm going all the way back to like September with you, Louie. This must be crazy, right? How about May 1975 is a billion seconds ago. You're like, whoa, that's a little bit bigger than a million. Oh yeah. A trillion seconds ago, you're like, uh-huh, I'm on the 1800s. No. Christopher Columbus? No. 29,700 BC is a trillion seconds ago. A quadrillion seconds ago, 30,800,000 years ago is a quadrillion seconds ago. We're talking about a really large number, and Musifi is so big, you could put 2.7 quadrillion Earths inside this one star. But it is not even the biggest star we have found. I love science, and science has just brought us the largest star they found. It's called, are you ready for this, Canis Majoris. Now, I'm no linguist, but that's a cool name for the biggest star we've found so far. I think that means the big dog star, and that's exactly what it is. I bring it to you as a little bitty purple, you know, glow just to the right of center there. But Canis Majoris, oh, wow. If the earth were a golf ball, <laughs> Canis Majoris would be the height of Mount Everest. Thank you. You just saved your family plane fare from California to Kathmandu, Nepal. Almost six miles above sea level, the highest point on the planet, and I just dare you to get up there and unzip the parka and pull out your golf ball. You could fit seven quadrillion Earths inside Canis Majoris. That's enough Earths if the Earth were a golf ball to cover the entire state of Texas in golf balls 22 inches deep. You see the one you're on? Maybe this will help a, a little bit more. This absolutely blew my mind. Just a little journey through our solar system. Everyone knows our planets and sort of how we fit in to the story here. You see really quickly that we're not even the biggest deal in our own solar system, but as Earth comes by, 
you have to know tonight that we are living on a privileged planet. Anyone would tell you we're living at one of the most special places, if not the most special place in all of creation. But Neptune comes by and Saturn and then Jupiter and you're like, okay, we're not all that big, even in our own little cul-de-sac. I just noticed the blue dot fading away is not the earth. That's Neptune. The earth has gotten too small to see anymore. Sirius comes by. Little plug for satellite radio. Not the biggest star, but the brightest star that we have found so far. Pollux, which we didn't mention. Arcturus. Such a beautifully named one, Regal. But then the one that messed me up. Our third star, Musifi. Musifi's cousin, W. Sifi. Majoris. And do you know that you couldn't come up here right now with a Sharpie and make a mark on the screen that would approximate the size of our sun? You couldn't even do it. I mean, when you look at these and their relative size, we just have to put a little arrow over there that says, if you could put the sun on here, which you can't, it would go somewhere about here. And um, can you hang on that for me? And when you see this, I don't know what happens to you, but I'll tell you what happens to me. A shrinking feeling comes over me, and it's not a bad shrinking feeling. It's a good shrinking feeling. Because sin, it has a a way of shrinking God down in our minds and puffing us up in our own estimation. But just a glance into the universe that God has made resizes everything in a heartbeat. And you realize tonight, we are worshiping an unrivaled, uncontested God of all kind of might and power and glory and awe, who is, there's none like him anywhere in all of creation tonight. We are not here worshiping some little teeny tiny God. We are the teeny tiny ones, you and me. We are small and weak and fragile and frail. We are, you and me tonight, one of six and a half billion people on this little golf ball sized planet in this massive universe that God has made. But I'll tell you the miracle of tonight is is crazy and crazier to me than the size of any star is that though we are but a vapor, you and me, and tiny and frail, we are marked by majesty. And we have been created in the very image of the God who breathes out the stars and put the universe into place. You and I are fashioned and formed and ordained by the God of all creation. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, you and I. We are a miracle. You're a miracle sitting in the building tonight. If I could just remind you just for a moment, you are somebody incredibly special. Let me just dial back to the beginning, and I I know you know this already, but in the very, very beginning, here's how you happened, okay? One cell from your mom found one cell from your dad. Now, there's more involved in that than that, but that's enough for us right now. And by the way, we should applaud the one cell from your dad because that one cell did a pretty heroic thing to be the one cell in the story that we're talking about tonight. One cell from your mom met up with one cell from your dad, each one carrying 23 chromosomes. The one from your mom was carrying half of her DNA. The one from your dad was carrying half of his DNA. And those two cells met and merged into one single cell. And when they did, those chromosomes matched, and they began to form together a brand new DNA code. 
using four characters, four nucleotides, they begin to write out what we have now discovered is the three billion character description of who you are written in the language of God. They wrote out your DNA, your human genome of three billion characters made up of those four simple nucleotides. And when they did, they described who God had ordained you to be. In that one little simple cell, scientists say if you took the DNA out of that one little cell and stretched it out, that DNA would be six feet long, three billion characters stretched out to six feet long. So amazing that if I were to read your DNA, reading one character per second, night and day, it would take me 96 years just to read the description of you. And when they formed together, they wrote out and painted a picture which had never been written before in the history of humankind. And then that cell did the unthinkable. It set out to build that model from one cell. I'm telling you, you are a miracle sitting in this building tonight. And you have come a long, long way. I mean, here you are. This may not be in the family photo album, but here you are (laughs) at three days old. 16 cells of you. You say, what in the world is that? It's a 16-cell human embryo on the tip of a safety pin at incredible magnification. So by now, that one cell had turned into 16 cells on its way to making the 75 trillion cells that make up your body tonight. Every one of those 75 trillion cells containing that six feet of the three billion character DNA code that you. There's so much DNA in your body, by the way. If you stretched it all end to end, there'd be enough DNA to go to the moon and back inside your body. 178,000 times. That's how amazing God has made you to be. 75 trillion cells in your body. And when I told you that, 50,000 of those cells died and were replaced by brand new cells when I told you that. And then just now, 50,000 more cells died and were replaced by brand new cells. It's happening every three seconds, day and night, all the days of your existence. And you wonder why you're tired all the time. I'll tell you, you're doing some amazing stuff night and day. We're miracles, you and me. I love the way Augustine said it, one of the great fathers of the church and of the faith. He just nailed it when he said it like this. Men go abroad to wonder at the height of mountains, the huge waves of the sea, the long course of rivers, the vast compass of the ocean, the circular motion of the stars, but they pass by themselves and they don't even notice. In the womb, miracles happening every moment. Here you are at five months in the womb. You remember those days, those were the good old days. (laughs) And just miracles happening every second. Let me tell you about one. Million optic nerve endings left the optic nerve center of your brain in the womb, headed for a million optic nerves that had left your eye. And they had to meet and match their exact partner, one million looking for one million. And when they found their exact partner out of a million and matched up together, in that instant you had sight. And anyone would tell you, that to this moment, the most technologically advanced thing on planet Earth is your eye. Oh, but it didn't do you any good because when that moment happened, you just had one piece of skin completely covering your eyeball. But as I read in one textbook, miraculously and mysteriously at about the sixth month, a little cutting device appeared and it cut perfectly that piece of skin. And you had eyelids for the very first time in your mother's womb. 
You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the God of the heavens is the one who fashioned you together. And he knows your name tonight. And he knows every single thing there is to know about you. And he's made you a promise that for those who trust in him, he will literally hold them in his hand and carry them all the days of their life. This Psalm 33 that talks about a star breathing God turns an interesting corner. It says, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood fast. That's power and awe. But now it gets very personal. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of them all and is intimately acquainted with everything they do. And then he goes even further. And he says, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him on those who hope in his unfailing love, and here comes his promise, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. And that is the promise tonight because this building and our world is filled with hurting people, with lives that are spinning out of control, with pain that we, don't, we didn't ask for or could never imagine. And God is making a promise to us tonight. He's saying, I am a universe maker and I am a heart former, but I'm also big enough to be intimately acquainted with all the circumstances of every one of your lives. And I promise you, no matter what comes in this lifetime, no matter how difficult the road or how dark the night, I will hold on to you and I will literally hold you together and carry you through any and every circumstance that ever comes your way any moment on this planet. It's the promise of God. And you say, well, man, that sounds good, but how do I know that's true of my life right now, Louis? I mean, that's really what we want to know tonight. And I'll tell you how you can know tonight that God will always hold you together no matter what. It's by looking a little deeper into the human body and it's a little protein molecule called laminin. That's about what I felt the first time I heard that. (laughs) Long story short, the tour was winding down last time around. We were in Tyler, Texas. The night was over. A guy walks up to me. I wish I could tell you the whole story. It was so of God. Introduces himself to me, says, how are you doing? I just want to say hello. I said, it's nice to meet you. He says, you guys winding the tour down. Uh, Where are you going to go from here? I said, well, I'm on my way back home to Atlanta, Georgia. He said, well, what's next for you? I said, I'm going to be preaching the next two Sundays for my pastor back in Atlanta. He said, oh, cool. What are you preaching on? I said, well, the series is on the glory of God and the human body. He said, that's really amazing. I'm a molecular biologist at the university down the road. Give me your talk. And I was like, oh, wow, I wasn't quite yet ready to unload the talk for a molecular biologist. So I kind of stumbled through what I had, and he's kind of being kind and gracious and like, "Uh uh-huh, that's good. And then he says, well, what's your big left hook? You got to have a left hook, a big finish, right? I said, I don't have a left hook yet. He said, oh, Louie, oh, man, your left hook is laminin. And I'm, I'm totally blank on laminin. And he goes, Louie, it's a cell adhesion molecule. Protein molecule? Do you know about proteins? I'm like, no. He said, Louie, cells organize into certain molecular structures, and that determines what protein there are. There are between 10 and 60,000 proteins in the human body. We don't even know how many proteins are in the human body. But one of them is a cell adhesion molecule. It's organized into this certain structure, and that tells the cell what its job is in the body. And this one is a cell adhesion molecule. And I'm like... All right. He said, no, Louie, it's like the rebar of the human body. The steel they put in the concrete when they lay the foundations of things, it's that stuff. It's it's holding your membranes together. It's the glue of the human body, Louie. It's laminin. you got to tell them about laminin. And I'm like, 
I promise you, I'm going home and tell them about laminin. And I'm sure when I do, revival is going to sweep across the church and probably around the world when I tell them. He said, no, 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 no. You've got to see laminin. I'm like, okay. Let's see it. He said, no, no, no. You need to go look it up online. You need to go Google laminin. I'm like, I don't even know how to spell laminin. <laughs> Takes his card out. He writes on the back, L-A-M-I-N-I-N. Okay, I cannot wait to get to my computer and get on Google, click on images, type in laminate, and I'm waiting, and these little thumbnails come up on the screen, and I'm like, wow, that's laminin? The cell adhesion molecule. Woo! <laughs> I am so excited. I am beside myself. I cannot believe what I'm seeing. I love laminin. I'm so fired up. You should see laminin, I guess. That's the thing, right? Okay. Here is a scientific diagram of the laminin cell adhesion molecule that's holding your body together right now. Okay, this is what I found right here. No, come on, that's crazy. That's just crazy. can't believe it. I emailed that guy back so fast. I'm like, wow, 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 wow. What in the world? He said, you want to see an actual laminin molecule? I'm like, oh, no, man. The diagram was cool for me. I'm happy with that. Don't, don't bother sending anything else. I'm like, yes. And he sends me this image, an electron microscopic image of an actual laminin protein molecule. It looks just like this. How crazy is that? That the stuff that holds our bodies together, that's holding the lining of your organs together, holding your skin on, is in the perfect shape of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And immediately I'm thinking about the words of Paul in Colossians 1. You know this beautiful passage where Paul's talking about the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. He says, for by him, talking about Jesus Christ, all things have been created, things in heaven and things on earth. All things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. But then the next verse goes on to say this. It's crazy. And he, Jesus, is before all things. And in him, that is, in Jesus Christ, all things hold together. It's right, it's right there. I'm like, of course they do. Of course they do. Everything holds together in Jesus Christ. And he goes on at the end of this paragraph, and he just tells the story of grace. He says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through Christ to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. So you're at the toughest place in your life. How can you know that God is going to hold you together and bring you through. You know because there is a cross standing over history and it is looming over this building tonight. It is the place where the star breather became the sin bearer. Where the universe maker became mankind's savior. And it is proof that God doesn't always change the circumstances. He did not change them for Jesus on that hillside outside Jerusalem. But the cross is also proof that God always has a purpose in the circumstances and that his purpose and his plan will prevail and will triumph through any circumstances in this world. So we just close with this question. 
found right in the middle of an interesting chapter in Isaiah 40 where it just talks about the expanse of God. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain, like a tent to dwell in. He leads forth the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name. But then it takes a turn. And the writer of Isaiah says, so why do you say, O Jacob? And why do you complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. Or say, my cause is disregarded by my God. In other words, there was a moment in the history of Israel when they felt like God had completely lost sight of them. That yes, I believe that God is big enough to make the world. I even believe that God ordained and made me. And now coming present tense, I'll accept the fact that God gave his son on a cross. But what I really need to know right now, what really matters most to me right now is does God see what I'm going through? Does he see what I'm carrying? Does he know that I can't take one more step or one more day? Does he care and can he do something? That's what I need to know. And Isaiah answers and he answers with another question. And it's a question for us here. He says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He's huge. He is a star breather. He's big. But listen to what he loves to do. That God, that creator of the ends of the earth, that I do not grow tired or weary, that my understanding is too great for you, that God, here's what he does. He gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. For even the youths will grow tired and weary and young men will stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord, another translation, those who wait upon the Lord. The Hebrew word simply means this, when it says hope and wait, it means that those who stand right in the midst of the craziness, right in the midst of the pain, right in the midst of the chaos, right in the valley of the shadow of death, and they don't gloss over it. They're dealing with the hardest stuff in life, but standing in the middle of it, they say, you know what? I don't see what God's doing. I don't understand what the plan is, but I'll tell you one thing. I am not gonna give up on God, and I'm gonna stand right here in the middle of this moment, and I'm gonna trust that God is sitting on a throne, that he has a purpose for my life and a plan for my life. And I believe I'm gonna see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And I'm not gonna stop believing that no matter what. That's what the word means to wait and to hope on the Lord. And he said, and here's the promise. You're gonna wake up to rosy circumstances. Oh, he can do that and he does do that. But the promise is greater than that. He said, those who wait upon the Lord, here's what I promise, I will renew your strength. And when you think you can't take one more breath, I'll give you enough to keep going on. And enough to keep going on. And enough to keep going on and to keep going, and to keep going, and to keep going. You keep hoping, and I'll keep causing strength to rise when you hope, and you'll keep going, and you'll feel like you have been swept up on the wings of eagles, and you will run and not get weary, and walk through it all, and not faint. He said, I will hold you, even when you let go of me, I'm not gonna let go of you. Do you know there are millions and millions and millions of microscopic crosses holding you together right now? And one giant glorious cross of Jesus Christ that's holding every one of us that's trusted in him onto the heavenly father and holding the heavenly father onto us and it's going to keep holding us onto him that cross forever and ever and ever and ever we will never not be carried by the strong hand of a universe making God and he will bring us through that is the promise of the everlasting God amen God bless you. Bless you. Bless you.
Well, I am glad that we finally got the video working. At first, some of you felt like you were still on your acid trip. It was all <laughs> But man, otherwise it was gonna be me trying to present that and I would not have done the justice that just happened. And that's why we show that video. And some of us are asking that last question. Is there a God out there that truly cares about us that can help us through these tough times? And does he even know? And I'm here and there's many that you'll see in your rooms that will say yes. Yes, he's there. Well guys, let's stand and close our time with the serenity prayer. We're running late. But let me give you the online people your uh, question of the time, if we have it. There it is. Um, how have you uh, seen God show up in your life and in your recovery? So check that out. But let's close our time with the serenity prayer. God, Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen, amen. Hey, group starts in two minutes. Get out there, just kidding. Hey, uh, start group at 745, facilitator 745, get it rolling.